All right. No, no she'll come back. Did I disappear? You're good. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm here with Holly Black and Coco Ma. Um, we, I'm going to just do the Vanna White section real quick, um, and then I'll get out of the way and let them chat. And then I'll come back and we'll do the audience questions. So to get your question in, um, there's an ask a question section right down here. Um, so put your questions there. And if you want them to be answered, make sure you guys vote on the ones that you're excited to hear um, both of these authors answer. And if you haven't already, check out the uh, book buying button here. Um, and you'll find Holly and Coco's books there. And They'll come with uh, personalized book plates, which is so awesome right now to be able to get these uh, book plates signed by the authors. Um, and yeah, that's that's my main spiel. So I'm gonna get out of the way and let you two chat and I'll be back, all right? Yeah, absolutely. Bye. 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 Hi. Hello. So, um, we are here to celebrate the publication of Godstorm. Yay! Um, I'm Holly Black. Um, yes. And uh, I am just gonna. Do you want? Should we introduce ourselves? Or should we just jump into questions. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> I read books. About fairies, a lot of them. Sometimes about some other stuff. <laughs> I write books about sword fighting queens and demons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start us off with a question that was asked when I was so when I was um, interrogating Cassie Claire. Um, this was an audience question. It was so great that I continue to ask it to everyone that I have interviewed since. And it is, what is the weirdest thing that you have bought during quarantine? Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Um, a lot of weird things. Well, I've gotten a few weird things. Um, there's like a, a tiny little Totoro back there. How tiny? So it's it's this one. Well, I would I'll go up and get it, but just don't worry. I'm wearing sweatpants. Like I didn't know I'd have to get up and wear sweatpants. So, <laughs> wear sweatpants. Um, so I got I had this one before, and then I realized that there was this tiny one, and at home I have one that's like this big, but that doesn't really compare to this birthday gift that I got which is a six foot bear. What? <laughs> and it's huge and I can barely lift it. And he lives on my floor because my room is, my dorm room is too small. That is a large bear. It is so big. Like, you should detag your bear. I know, but if I detag my bear, then I'll grow attached to it. But it's too big for my room, so I'm I'm scared what will happen when I have to move out of my dorm at the end of the year. Well, that is a weird item. A weird it is. Thing. It is pretty weird. So, um, to go back to our to the topic at hand, can you tell us a little bit about the series? How did you first come up with Auto Frost? Um, did you know it would be a trilogy from the start? Well, so here is Shadow Frost. And actually, I just opened this absolutely gorgeous by Edged in Starlight. Um, they sent it to me, and it's really sparkly. I don't think you can see it on camera, but. You can see it. Okay. It's, I yeah. have my non sparkly. <laughs> yeah, the Godstorm one hasn't been painted yet. So, um, but Shadow Frost began in, I think, 20, 2016 or something like that. I was, I was in 10th grade and I had to write um, a series of short stories for a school project. And at the beginning, I was just, you know, writing the first one and then it just kept getting longer and longer and longer. And 
I got about like 50,000, 60,000 words in and I was like, I still have so much story left to tell. Uh, so I ended up finishing it and I thought, why not try and get it published? And then uh, ended up signing for a three book contract. <laughs> um, and then Godstorm was the byproduct of that. And of course, a third book, which the title hasn't been revealed for yet, um, which is very exciting. Uh, Shadow Frost is a loose retelling of Snow White, very, very loose. Um, and Godstorm, rather than following like a single fairy tale structure, has like a bunch of little nods to fairy tales like peppered in throughout the plot. Um, so I hope readers have fun trying to catch all of them. <laughs> I was, I was actually going to ask you about fairy tales and about um, just what made you want to pull those into a fantasy work? Like, what do you think that having fairy tale resonances gets you in a story like this? Yeah, I mean, for one thing, fairy tales obviously always come with like some kind of moral. Um, and I think those were very, very interesting to play with in Shadow Frost and Godstorm. I think uh, sometimes fairy tale morals can be like a little, a little out there and not necessarily super applicable to real life. <laughs> but um, I think Shadow Frost and Godstorm have a lot of morals that are, you know, very personal to me and a lot of lessons that, you know, I've been learning and I've learned um, lots of stuff about friendship about determination and young people doing amazing things um, and yeah, never giving up, that sort of thing, so. All right, so can you talk a little bit about the world building process for this series? Um, what did you start with? When did the map come? Um, <laughs> I am very intimidated by maps and names. There are so many names in high fantasy. So how, what was your process and, uh, and when did you draw that map? Oh my God. Okay. So I, look, I, I, I just want to mention first that actually my, my dad illustrated the map, which was That's like, yeah, I got it. yeah, postcard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think my the right I way? started, sorry. No, no, sorry. <laughs> I started off with mostly just, you know, the central kingdom, and then, you know, the magic system in Shadow Frost is based off nine elemental affinities, which include things like ice and water and fire and earth and illusion and light and all of that fun stuff. And it ended up growing to be that each of the kingdoms represented one of these affinities because um, like the god or goddess of that element um, basically uh, gave way to this bloodline, this royal bloodline um, in the world. And so um, once I figured out like which kingdoms, you know, were going to be involved in the story, then uh, I think I started like sketching out a map on like the back of my math homework or something like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, it was, it was really nice because like, of course, usually I'm, and I'm sure you've experienced this, like, it's like a really, it's really weird having to like put the map in the first book and having to decide like all of the the places that might not necessarily like actually be in the first book and then like once you get to the second and third book if you realize oh wait there's like a place i wish i could have put on the map but you kind of have to like um just sort of figure out how to ways around that and that sort of thing i just no. added it to the map <laughs> if you look at the three but if you look at the three um wait, yeah really yeah, they change. Wait, I didn't know that. Yeah, I just added things to the map. <laughs> I didn't. Do that. I mean, like, I just thought that I would. Ha I just like had to stick to the first map. So my way around that was like <laughs> diving into the mortal realm, which we didn't have a map for in the first book. Um, so so I had like a lot more freedom. But that's a, that's a pretty good strategy. I should have thought about it. <laughs> Each book. Fresh map. <laughs> yeah. Wait, where, what, what, like, between the second and the third book, which, what were the new places that cropped up? The island. Ah. Uh, and and, the I mean, and then I guess that has, that has such a good and then a couple little places. Yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, like, the island is perfect because, like, it literally rises <laughs> from the sea. Um, 
So, okay. Um, try to figure out which one I should <laughs> ask next. Um, well, let me ask you this. What is it like to be a young writer? You know, you sold your book at 16? Yeah. Is that right? um, what has it been like to have a career as a novelist and trying to balance that with high school, with college? I mean, it's definitely a struggle sometimes. I don't think I would ever deny that. Um, there have been moments where it just feels like completely overwhelming, but I've been so lucky. I mean, like people like you and, you know, the, the reader and writing com community has just been so supportive. So like, even when I feel like, you know, I don't know if I can handle all of this, I just, you know, I just think of all of the people who have been there for me and I just think like, I gotta pull through. Um, it definitely has been a learning experience. <laughs> uh, transitioning from high school to college was like really weird uh, because like I'm, I like went into a grad program straight out of high school. So I didn't have like any of the resources that are usually like offered to an undergrad program, um, like college or not college, obviously not college counselors because you're already in college, um, but like guidance counselors and just like that sense of, you know, having lots of friends who are all having the same experience where it's like their first year of university, first year away from home. Um, and I think that started to uh, like manifest in my stories as well. I mean, Godstorm has a lot to do with, you know, losing someone really important to you. Um, having people who you you thought would always be with you not really be there anymore like what it's like to kind of feel like that like that feeling of loneliness and you know setting yourself on a path and just like needing to keep going and that sort of thing um but yeah it's been really wild i'm i'm i feel really grateful that like i can live off like at this age i can just you know have you know, a piece of cake and then I'm good for the day. Like I'll just be like running around energy, all of that. I feel like even now compared to like when I was 18, I'm like, it's only been two years, but I feel like a little more tired. Now. <laughs> like I remember the first time, like when I met you at book con, mm -hmm. I was like, I was getting like four or five hours of sleep, but I was running around the convention center nonstop. Like I was, so full of energy i started off the day with like a big <laughs> smile like everything was i was so excited and i just i just i hope that i can continue to have that like youthfulness at heart <laughs> well you'll have that youthfulness till you don't <laughs> <laughs> i guess that's true Age comes for us all oh god <laughs> <laughs> a long time yeah i mean i i don't I don't know. You're you're so you're so energetic all the time. So tired. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'm sure you have a lot of young readers who are also writers and who may be here right now and you know maybe thinking about sending their work out to agents and to editors. And so I have two questions about that. You know, one. What advice would you have for them? And then, which may be the same and may be different, like what is the advice you wish someone had given to you at that point? So first of all, I mean, I think you should never let age or anything be a bar of like, um, like to, to, to prevent you from going out and sending your manuscript. Um, I remember, cause like when I was younger, um, people would say like, oh, you should just wait until you're in your 20s. Like, you know, um, I don't think your chances are very good. Like, I remember I was doing research on how to write query letters and I asked um, some like some some writers and, you know, they said, I don't think you should even include your age because, you know, agents won't take you seriously if you say you're that young. But I feel like that's just, you know, that's I, that should never, you know, be a factor that stops you from, you know, sharing your story and, 
you've worked so hard on a book, you've put your love and energy and blood and sweat and tears into it, of, of course I think um, you should go for it. And obviously there's like a lot of, you know, aspects to the process of querying and publishing that you should definitely do a lot of research on. Things like how to write a query letter. I know there's like a really great blog called Query Shark um, that I definitely did a lot of research on that shows you like some very obvious like mistakes that you might want to avoid. Um, things for example like accidentally putting the wrong title in the in the greeting <laughs> or something like that if you don't know um, the gender of the agent you're sending and submitting to and also of course you know submitting to agents that you really want representation from rather than just you know uh, like spam sending <laughs> query letters because um, I mean the way I the way I like to query is like it's like applying to college because you know you you want to eventually end up at a college that you really care about and that you really want to be at um, and advice that I would have given to myself, I think I'm like, I'm not a very patient person. <laughs> and I remember when I was first, you know, querying and just sort of going through that process, I, I, I genuinely thought that if I just answered emails as fast as I could, my book could be published in less than a year, which was like, really cute <laughs> um but you no know, yeah. it was already realistic though that you were even thinking a year like yeah, I, know. You know, I think people think a month a month you know uh, i think yeah. sometimes people don't realize like why does it take so long yeah and i remember once the process like actually got started i was i couldn't believe how fast time was flying because there's so much involved there's you know revisions and editing and copy editing and cover design and all of that stuff and like audiobook name pronunciation and like so stuff like that which was actually really weird because i remember like recording an audio file of me reading some of the names that i had like written down on the page and like knew how to pronounce in my head and then actually saying them out loud and be like wait i just have no idea <laughs> So wait, what is the advice you would give? And what's the, oh, all right. <laughs> oh the advice the advice I would give to myself is like be more patient, I think. Um yeah, and also, you know, you put so much, like I said, blood, sweat, and tears into writing writing the darn thing. And then once you once you get it into publishing stages, you kind of have to let a lot of things go, which was really hard for me because I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm definitely a control freak. So I kind of wanted to get my fingers in every little thing. And I think I I was so blessed because my publishers, I think really tolerated that because maybe they're like, oh, she's younger. We'll just, we'll just tolerate it. But yeah, don't, don't do that. <laughs> well, I think um, I'll say this. So I also submitted a book when I was maybe 14 and it was summarily rejected as it should have been because it was terrible. Um, I have written, I've read aloud from it truly to much laughter. It is not a complete <laughs> book. Um, and, uh, you know, I would still say, even having had that experience, that it was great to send it out. Like, I think you're a thousand percent right. I remember being rejected and, you know, no one likes to be rejected, but I remember really feeling like, wow, I'm in it. Like, because I knew writers got rejected. And so it felt like an, it felt like an accomplishment to be rejected, if you know what I mean. And yeah, I, so yeah. I agree, like, send stuff out, go yeah. for it. You learn so much from just like actually going through the process. I mean, it's one thing, cause I mean, like one question that I get asked is like, oh, how do I, how do I become better at writing? And of course, the answer is like to to do a lot of writing and just to, right. to write. Um, and then in regards to things like authoring, you know, publishing is such a huge process, and I I learned so much. I I don't think I could have learned anywhere near as much if I had just you know sat down for a few years and like polished shadow frost as much as i could just like getting it out there i mean there are lots of things that 
you know, even reading back on now, like I feel like I could definitely improve on and I hope that I can continue to grow as an author, but I couldn't have done any of that if this hadn't happened. And I think that, I think when you are somebody who is younger than a lot of people, you may feel like I'm doing this because I'm young. But like, I, I think almost every writer whose first book is coming out harasses their publisher and wants like to get their <laughs> Was so normal to me, um, you know, and I think that everybody feels that way about their first book. I just got to go back to the modern fairy tales, um, Tide being my very first book, and rewrite little pieces of it. And I was so happy because there were so many little things about her. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like I think it's great you're getting all this out of the way because it's yeah. what you're talking about are so universal experiences, they really are. Um, so in addition to being a professional novelist, <laughs> a professional musician. So a lot of times people talk about prose being like music. And as an actual musician, how true do you find that to be? That is a very interesting question. I honestly, probably like not at all. <laughs> um, no, I think, there's something to be said about the structural aspect and like the overarching plot of a story arc but in terms of like sentence structure and prose no <laughs> not at all i mean of course there's like the beginning of a phrase and the end of the sentence and but past that you know in mu i think music is just completely different from from writing because you know Obviously writing is up to interpretation, but at least you're being you're being given, you know, the meaning of like a sentence, for example, right? But mm -hmm. whereas for music, it's like, you know, it's it sounds, right? And it's not like it's not uh it's not linguistic sound in, in the sense that, you know, you have individual words and that sort of thing. It's just harmonies and rhythms. And I mean, like like I said, I mean there's definitely a lot of inspiration that I take from music to writing and vice versa but in terms of sentences and like prose and stuff i don't think so <laughs> all right so um so here are two theories of the trilogy okay once i was told the first book is characters and the second book is world building but i don't remember what they said about the third book um the other theory uh, is that the first book is a kiss, second book is make it out, third book, also don't remember. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Now that you're on uh, the third book of a trilogy, do either of the, these theories, these structural theories, uh, seem true to you? Um, <laughs> I mean, sorry, I just like, I can't forget that the first joke you told me like, oh god! Oh, the hand one—the one that I laughed at for like forty minutes. Um, like, I, please tell it later. But um, basically, okay. So, I guess I. You know what? Honestly, I feel like both are a little relevant. Um, <laughs> so no, I'm really no, I'm forward. Forward. Yeah. yeah. To be looking forward to um the third book okay so i feel like the third book has basically when i when i wrote shadow frost i didn't expect it to be a trilogy but i did have an idea for like a possible end game um that originally i think i was planning for the end of the first book but like once obviously once the contract was signed and it was it became three books i was like oh my god okay let's escalate this like super hard and then you know basically everything comes together in this this enormous climax that has basically spanned across three books so you know like i am very intimidated but also really excited to write like that you know kind of scene near the end um i have two endings in mind one that i think people will really hate me for and then one that people will really 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 hate me for so <laughs> i need to choose one okay. but um 
not to give any spoilers, but um, yeah, I think just seeing how the characters have grown over the course of the three books, as I've also grown as well from like being a 15 year old writer to a, an adult writer, um, I think that's that's been very interesting for myself to also reflect upon. All right, so final question before we go to all y'all's questions. <laughs> um, what is coming up next? We have a third book, but- yes, a third book. Oh my God. Okay, well, I mean, the first thing I thought of, yeah. Okay, so, well, so there is, of course, a very exciting project that I'm also working on, a very secret project. It's the fourth book, um, not Shadow Frost related. It's the first book in a new series um, that is based in current day or like slightly um, futuristic Manhattan, in New York City. And it has monsters and magic and like schools for training monster slayers and <laughs> and like lots of um i would say i would call it like a mythology of new york city because you know i i grew up with percy jackson and you know it was just so incredible seeing like the mix of reality with <clears throat> excuse me with greek mythology of course and roman mythology and eventually norse and <laughs> like all of the other stuff um and i and I felt like, you know, I really, I, I lived in New York for two years um, while I was attending Juilliard for piano. And I spent so many hours just walking the streets and exploring the city and just like feeling the vibes. So I just really, really wanted to kind of write this almost like love letter to New York City um, through my own kind of way with, with fantasy. And so I, I really wanted to create sort of like a New York City mythology. So I'm really excited for that. I'm really excited for it too. Yes. Right. <laughs> so, and now, ta-da! I'm back on cue. Hello. <laughs> Hello. All right, so let's get to these audience questions. The first one is, have either of you ever read any fan fiction about your books? And maybe more generally, how do you feel about fan fiction? That is a great question. Holly, I want it. I'm so looking forward to answer. <laughs> so I have never read any fan fiction about my own work. And I will tell you why. Because I know that I can change anything I want but this would seem fixed to me. So I'm worried that I would think that that seemed tr more true than the thing I was doing. <laughs> like I would just, because it was done, right? It's full and complete. Whereas everything that I do is so constantly in flux. So I just felt like I, I couldn't or it would just be in my head. Um, but so I will tell you um, when I was a young writer, I was in my twenties. I was trying to finish my first book. It was the first time I came across fan fiction. And I always wanted to be a writer. And I was, a, but I was really miserable. I was working on that book and um, I had all of these ideas about how you were supposed to be a writer. And I remember reading fan fiction and being like, people are writing novel length works for fun. <laughs> and it, it really got me in touch with the idea that writing was supposed to be about reader pleasure. It was supposed to be about what you liked and not what you should do. And so I think it was super helpful to me to see that it existed. So have you read any fan fiction in general? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, oh, yeah okay. I mean, I've definitely read Cool Prince fiction. <laughs> How, is it good? Oh, it's, it's, very, it's very good. It's yeah, very I, I would good. be intimidated. I'd be like, <laughs> um, I mean, I have to admit, I mean, because I started off kind of writing fan fiction. Um, the first thing, well, the, the very first thing I did was write fan fiction about my classmates. Um, and then I, I, I remember I tried. To <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty wild. Um, and I remember trying to publish it onto like a fan fiction forum and wondering why like I couldn't enter 
in like my own characters without you know referencing a fandom and that's how i discovered fan fiction like proper fan fiction and so i remember reading it and then starting to write it and even when i was writing shadow frost i was still like writing other fan fiction um nowadays it's like kind of too hard to you know i don't have enough time to do both um unfortunately but uh i have to say one of my like when I was writing Shadow Frost, I just remember thinking like it would be so, so cool to see fan fiction of like characters that I've created. So there's a chance that I might have like checked it out. But I'm like, a, I'm so, I've like anything. I'm just like the kind of person who, who wants to know like everything that's going on. It's like fan fiction reviews. I'm so bad about this. I know how many times you've told me this like don't read don't go and read the reviews and like how many other people have i can't help it but like you know i'm i'm starting to get better about it but um yeah it's i've and i have one friend actually who wrote a, a fan fiction for shadow frost and it was absolutely lovely and i loved it and i mean like i felt like you know of course like that was that was very special it was like her little gift to me and it was really sweet so yeah that's my story <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, do you guys have a favorite fandom that you like to read fan fiction from that's not your own? Not anymore. Uh, and I have a really weird relationship with fan fiction anyway because, again, I don't like reading things that are about things I super love. I like things to read fan fiction about things that I kind of like. So that I don't get, like, I don't get upset if they do my favorite character are wrong. Like I like when it's, I came in reading Star Wars fan fiction and I was like, this is also very puzzling, but fascinating. <laughs> and I have always stuck to like things I like, but do not love. Enjoyed Sherlock fan fiction, very good. I was about to say I'm the exact opposite. I always love reading fan fiction for fandoms that I'm like really, really passionate <laughs> about. And BBC Sherlock was like a very, very big one. Um, and I think the other big one for me was Kingsman the Secret Service because that's like my favorite film. Um, and so, you know, if you if you've watched that movie and you know about Harry, then that that's there's a there's a reference obviously in Shadow Frost to that character. <laughs> oh. Finding all sorts of interesting things out. <laughs> um, all right, the next question is from Lauren. What is your favorite giveaway item, merch, fan art, fan gift, etc., that you have ever seen or received? Mm. That's that's pretty. That's... I have to say, the sprayed edges on on oh, the book yeah. that you held up yeah. is amazing. Like, so cool. Yeah, this honestly, this has definitely been. I just like, I I, I definitely cried a little bit when I saw it. <laughs> So pretty. I mean, I've gotten so many like beautiful pieces of art that it's really hard to, it's hard to pick some particular thing. I know someone once made me a glass casket with Severin sleeping inside, which was super beautiful. It's like this big, it's in the other room. But then somebody made me these stickers um, that are curse worker stickers, but they're in the style of, um, oh, uh, I totally forgot. I'm totally blanking on it, but they're they're these just fabulous like sticker. I mean, it's just I don't know. It is humbling to get stuff because you always think like, what can I give you? Like I don't have anything on me. <laughs> I can't give you. Well, it's, anything. it's kind of like with uh, the fan fiction, right? You've given them these worlds to be fans of, and just it's so cool to be able to participate in it. And like with these author events, like just being able to hear you guys talk and you know engage in in the world somehow is i think what makes it so cool for a lot of us readers yeah i mean i also just thought i tend to get a lot of cake uh, at events <laughs> which is awesome <laughs> like, i remember the first time i got cake at book at book book con and it was like i just i held it in my hands and i was like i've seen the new world <laughs> but also holly this one. Wait, it's too bright to see. Comfy. <laughs> From last year. Yeah, I know. I have, I have the one that you gave me. It's uh, somewhere behind me. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, having any sort of big, big good at a, at a book event is always welcome. Um, all right, so the next question is, what was the last book that you recommended a friend read? Uh, let's see. I feel like something's about to happen. Hey! Uh, I just got my yes. Owl Crate edition, and I'm waiting for your Owl Crate. Also, the King of How the King of Elfland takes stories, and I'm super excited. Yeah, so I'm yeah. This I've been just like I think I've been recommending this since V like first mentioned it that it was like a thing. Like when it was on Goodreads, and I didn't have didn't definitely didn't have a cover yet. Like nothing. Just like at the very beginning, I was like, oh my god, everyone has to read this now. <laughs> so it really is. I'm trying to think what about what I you? It last. I think I probably recommended that my husband read Gideon the Ninth because he hasn't yet, and all our friends have. And he's he keeps <laughs> like, coming in on Gideon discussions and not understanding what's happening. Oh yeah, I have that one too. Everyone at the store absolutely loves both of those recommendations. I have the one. Hey! Oh, you got the uh, the coveted black sprayed edges. Yes, I actually have two of them, and I'm looking for something to do with the second one so yeah tamsin is so awesome uh, you might get offers in the comment section honestly <laughs> start the bidding <laughs> um all right next question if you could spend a day in your world with the caveat that you would be safe where would you go and what would you do I love the caveat because, yes, yeah. <laughs> because that's very necessary. Um, I think I would, well, if, if I would definitely be safe, I would absolutely go to the mortal realm. Um, I think it would be super fun. Basically in the mortal realm, uh, there are these, these sleighs that you can summon like taxis. Um, and they are, they are like these, uh, these, basically these butterflies, which are the, um, the like the mascot basically of the god of shadow King Eowyn and so you you whistle and then they all flutter from like the horizon and come to you and they form this this sleigh that will take you wherever you need to go and then you just like go gliding um, over over the kingdom and I think that would be that would be super super fun to try out. I mean if I would be safe go party I go to a level, I would eat all that food, I would drink all that wine. Oh yeah. Look in the look of masks. Yeah. I would do all the things that you shouldn't do. <laughs> it's a free pass with that caveat. Uh let's see. Our next question. Which actor or celebrity would you cast for some of your characters if it were adapted into a film or TV show? I'm terrible at this one, and I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm really good at it. Um, you know, having been through the process of having a film uh, with Spider Rick, I will say, I don't care what they look like. I know this is an unpopular opinion. I don't care what they look like. I just want them to be good. <laughs> um, I feel like I, I was, I was gonna say I have like almost the same answer, but. I am so bad at, at like, I, there are some people that are just so good. They just like, they see a character and they make those mood boards and it's like, oh my God, yeah, that's <laughs> perfect. But I, I can't, I like, I remember like scrolling through lists and like, should I look this one, this one, <laughs> like just like for fun. I could never, I could never, but I think I would just be grateful with whatever. And yeah, I, I guess I would appreciate if they were good. <laughs> <laughs> has has anyone ever suggested someone to you and you've been like, yeah, that's perfect? Yes, but I don't remember who it was. <laughs> but I, there is one that I do remember. It is this, oh God, it's this, it's this model from like, from like Finland or something to play Quinlan, and he has the most amazing cheekbones 
and like the jawline of a god. And so I was like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can't help you there with that name. <laughs> Swedish Swedish models, her? I'm up on. Not. not so much on the Finnish models. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I also can't help you with this question. What is the astrology sign of each of your main characters, oh, yeah. regardless of their actual birth date? So you need to make some really uh, harsh judgment calls about them. And I don't know anything about astrology, so I can't help you. Okay, well, I think, I mean, the, the, the format I usually get this question is, is what Hogwarts house, like your characters would be placed in. Um, I'm also, unfortunately, not huge on astrology. I did get a book to read about it, and I haven't gotten to it yet, but I will. Um, but I think, okay, so Aster, I'm a Leo. So I think by default, the way Asterin, Asterin's character is portrayed, I think she would probably also be a Leo. She's very um, attention seeking <laughs> and can be quite stubborn at times. Um, I think uh, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to base it off. Now I'm just trying to base it off like people that I know. Uh, I think uh, maybe Luna might be an Aries. I'm not sure. My dad is an Aries and I and I like him a lot. So. I'm an Aries, so please tell me what that okay, means. Okay, cool, cool. So, so very very kind and compassionate and and I I'm, I'm basing it off my dad. So, <laughs> it applies to you. I know you're not basing it off me. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, I mean like and of and this is like sort of spoiler, but um that changes throughout the second and the third book. And that's all I'm gonna say. What about you, Holly? I've written 32 books. Too many characters, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, let's see. What, what inspires you to write? It's very open question, so. I think I mean, when it started, it was just, I, I think I just really wanted a creative outlet. Um, and I found that in writing, like I, I tried a lot of, I tried drawing, it was okay, not very good. Pottery, it was okay, probably worse. <laughs> um, but writing just really clicked with me. I think like just seeing, seeing, you know, your outside wonderful world and, or worse world, yes, Holly. But what about music? Oh yeah, there's that too. Oh um, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 music, music. No, but okay, okay. The biggest thing though for me was reading because I was such a huge reader. Um, I was like consuming like a book a day, that kind of thing when I was younger, and I absolutely loved fantasy novels. Um, Throne of Glass was one of the first YA fantasy books that I read and it was like mind-blowing. I was obsessed with it um, and so that definitely inspired me a lot. Like the books that I read now, I mean, Cold Prince, the plot twist in that series, like I don't even want to get into that, but like I was like, I was literally throwing my shoes in the third book um, and so reading has been a really, really big inspiration to me. I think that's probably the biggest one. I mean, I think I think writers are often people who get interested in weird things without really being sure why. You know, um, I have found myself having some kind of bizarre obsession with a you know something that doesn't seem pertinent to the book that I'm writing and winds up being pertinent to another book at some later point. And then things that I think that have nothing to do with writing at all, like. Um, I watch really terrible reality television, like really terrible, like not even like the good kind of like art, like terrible reality television. Try, and, try, um, try me. Well, I think we I'm watch gonna, the same things. I'm gonna tell you a story. <laughs> we'll see if it's, so, um, you know, I, there is a, when I was, when I was sitting down and I was thinking through the idea of vampires, 
um, one of the things that I thought about was, in fact, reality television and the way, you know, would I watch a show, for instance, where somebody, you know, where there were a bunch of people and that there was also some vampires and then maybe somebody got killed and drained every third or fourth episode. And I was like, nearly I would. Um, and a lot of that came out of the fact that, so do you remember a show called Megan Wants a Millionaire? What is it? I've gone too deep. Okay. So if you, do you remember Flavor of Love? Yes. And Flavor of Flav tries to find love? And Rock of Love, a, then a Rock classic. of Love is a spinoff, yeah. right? Then yeah. if you spin off that with one of the contestants, you get Megan Watts a Millionaire. But you cannot be blamed for not knowing this because it was canceled halfway through its season when one of the um, contestants in really real life killed his girlfriend and then himself. Allegedly, since he was never convicted due to having killed himself. Um, and I like, I was just so fascinated with the fact that reality had bumped up against what we call reality. But truly, that whole um, Coal Town came completely out of like my weird love of reality television and my knowledge that there are at least two decks linked to shows. So, I just I have to know for personal curiosity, what are the other terrible reality TV shows that you watch? Well, I watch all the Housewives because you will know that in Real Housewives of, of Beverly Hills, um, one of the husbands uh, was caught, I believe, evading taxes and was so upset that he killed himself. And they did not pull the show. Unlike Megan Watson Millionaire, they shot the rest of the season without being a storyline. And um, at the reunion special, Lisa Vanderpump, who is a real person whose name is that, um, said, I don't think, you know, maybe we shouldn't have done this season. And I thought, you know, you have a point, but I watched it half paying attention, writing my book and answering email. Like while this totally, this human tragedy was happening. And if I could do that, then definitely I would watch vampires draining people. Well, Vanderpump Rules is amazing as speaking of spinoffs. It is really uh, and that was a really have, early season of. I have no idea what's going on right now. All, I, like, do you I just, watch like, any Hell's, reality TV? Do you have any time to Hell's do that? Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen. I remember I used to watch Hell's Kitchen, and I love Gordon Ramsay. So, yeah. And we also, have, Great British Bake Off. I, I guess it tends to revolve around food. <laughs> we have been watching uh, MasterChef, which has Gordon Ramsay on it. Been going through all those on Hulu. So we like Gordon Ramsay here too. So um, can inspire sweet. books, anything. No matter I've been looking how much and how unlikely it seems. Jenny watches all these TV shows, and I've been looking to the wrong place for inspiration. All the human storylines are in these reality TV shows that I need. If it can happen in, in reality, it sure can happen in a book, right? <laughs> That's very true. Um, all right, you talked a little bit about uh, the importance of reading. So do you set a good reads yearly challenge or do you have some sort of book count goal? I endeavor to set a good reads challenge and meet it. Um, however, my, my challenge is to get through the books that I've actually purchased before, before like this is probably gonna be a lifetime goal where I finished every single book I own and then get a new one, which is, I don't think that's ever gonna happen. Like I, I have a lovely pile in my room right now, staring at me right off camera <laughs> that I really, really want to get to. But sometimes it's just so hard, you know, and especially like um, mixing or not mixing, but reading in the same genre that you're writing. Sometimes it can get like a little confusing and um, I, I try to avoid that, but sometimes it's it's unavoidable if a, a if a book is like really staring at me like there is one. <laughs> what is on your TBR pile? On my TBR pile is the Starless Sea, the Priory of the Orange Tree, Skyward. Uh, let's see what else. Um, oh, I finished I finished the I finished Good Omens, which was awesome, and also Sorcery of Thorns. Hmm. Um, Holly, what about you? I mean, yeah, like, I don't have a Goodreads challenge. I, you know, I find it, it's hard sometimes to read for fun. 
between like reading stuff that you have to read professionally for various different reasons and then um you know stuff that you have to read for research like right now the thing i'm trying to get to is a whole bunch of stacks of books that i i need for the thing i'm researching a bunch of crime books and also some old gothics and uh, i have some mary stewart books and uh you know in in all that sometimes it's hard to be like like i've started harrow so many times and i just and then i had something else comes up and i can't go on i mean especially this year like reading is just a challenge um, how like has the no. writing and everything been this year for both of you? Yeah, ironically, it's, you know, with all of that, that extra time, I got almost nothing done. <laughs> it's very unproductive. Um, it's just, it's, yeah, it was, it was really weird. I mean, like now I look back, like with, with all of the schoolwork and the piano stuff going on and and other aspects of life, I look back on the time where I was trapped inside my house with my parents for like months on end. And I think like, why did I get more stuff done? But then, you know, I also remember past Coco making a mental note to future Coco and saying like, don't, don't, don't regret this because you probably wouldn't be able to get anything done anyway, because it just like, the unproductivity levels were just like skyrocketing. Yeah, I didn't get, I did not get nearly <laughs> as much as I thought I would. I mean, this year, um, you know, for for various reasons, terror, um, the fact that my mm -hmm. step girl was home all the time, and so you know, we were doing like classes or trying to you know figure out something for him to do. Yeah, I didn't get any. I mean, I got some stuff done. I got some stuff done, but it's bad. And I don't know anyone who's having it, who had a, a good time. There was one guy, I was doing world fantasy panel, and he was like, I got twice my word count. Guy, I still remember that guy. Nobody else. No names. Well, uh, <laughs> you know the name. Uh, I mean, the scariest part is that we're reaching the point where I feel like reality TV shows have run out of content. I know. That's the end of TV. We've actually come to the end of TV. It is. You, we haven't reached the end of the internet, which that might happen in the next couple of days. Um, hmm. I don't know, man. That I feel like the internet memes. There will always be memes. There will always be memes. There will always be memes. <laughs> All right, so I think we're at the end of time, but I want to ask one question, um, which is what um, are you doing to bring yourself joy over the next week? Is it a food? Is it uh, are you reading something, hanging out with people um, in your house, probably? Uh, what is that thing that brings you joy? Well, I... I actually went to the arcade yesterday and I won the I won a I won a jackpot for one of the games a bunch of a bunch of times for some reason. So I got this. <laughs> so this is this is bringing me joy. Oh yeah, and also I have another one. Wait, it's not the same thing, but let me see if I can do this without. It's it's probably kind of hard to see, but it's like this glitter lava lamp. Hold on. This is probably dangerous, but. <laughs> and that was also from the arcade? It was also from the arcade. <laughs> Good arcade. A... No, the arcade was completely empty. Because... Are you a secret arcade hustler? <laughs> no, <laughs> but actually because of that single game, I could consider that. <laughs> <laughs> now you just got to resell all these prizes you get on the uh, on eBay or something and you'll definitely recoup your money. I know, actually, in terms of the value of the prizes, that already happened. But I think I I like I like I like my spin light on glue. I want to keep it. Don't take it away from me. Okay, we will. <laughs> what about you, Holly? So um, tomorrow I'm going to be a poll worker. Uh, I'm excited about it. It'll distract me for most of the day. 
And I have no plans beyond that. None. <laughs> Except for crawling up the walls. I mean, I got a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> My night. Do you are you a poll worker like from open the close? No, I'm uh, I'm the night shift. I'm doing one thirty to eight thirty. Cool. My normal. Well, thank life. you for doing that. I knew that, that, that was a morning to evening <laughs> too early. <laughs> well, that's a great thing to do and a good way to uh, keep yourself occupied okay. and positive. Um, okay. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you so much to everyone for, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing at your disco ball. That should have been on the whole time. It really should. How is that not the weirdest thing you've got? <laughs> uh, this has been such a fun conversation. It was great to get to meet both of you. And thank you everyone who um, showed up and asked questions. Make sure you Click that buy link down below and and get both of the uh, both of their new books and pre-order. Um, yeah. Sorry, how? <laughs> A little shot of frost. Yay! Wait. Thank God, storm. Um, and then pre-order how the King Elfheim learned to hate stories, which is out November twenty third. Is that right? Could be. I thought it was the 24th, but it could be the 23rd. Um, <laughs> it, it's going to be this month. Yep. <laughs> if you pre order it, it doesn't matter. It just shows up. <laughs> That's the nice thing about pre orders. Um, all right. Well, everyone have a good night and stay sane tomorrow. Um, and again, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you it was so really much. fun. It was so nice talking to you all. Yes. Bye. Bye.